mich habe erkannt im Laufe meines Lebens, je mehr ich mich mit der Physik beschäftige, dass ich eigentlich ein Metaphysiker bin. Und äh, damit habe ich mich dann mehr und mehr gespielt. Und wenn Sie mich fragen, ja lieber Hans und Förster, was ist ein Metaphysiker? Dann sage ich Folgendes. Es gibt unter den Fragen, die wir stellen über die Welt, gibt es solche, die man beantworten kann. Heinz von Förster, wie alt sind Sie? Das kann man beantworten, kann man nachsagen, Katalog, 1911 geboren, das ist jetzt 90. Oder man kann Fragen, die nicht beantwortet werden können. Wie zum Beispiel, Heinz von Förster, sag einmal, wie ist das Weltalt entstanden? Ja, da kann ich eines von den 35 verschiedenen Theorien sagen. Und ich frage einen, einen äh, äh, Sternkundigen, und er sagt, da war doch dieser Big Bang vor 20 Millionen Jahren. Oder ich frage einen braven Katholiken, und sagt, jeder weiß, wie das entstanden ist, da hat Gott die Welt erschaffen. Und nach sieben Tagen war er müde und hat eine, hat eine Pause gemacht, das war der Sonntag. Also da gibt es verschiedene, sehr interessante Hypothesen, ob wie das Welt entstanden ist. Das heißt, es gibt deswegen so viele Hypothesen, weil die Frage nicht beantwortbar ist. So kommt es nur darauf an, wie interessant ist die Geschichte, die der erfindet, wie das Weltall entstanden ist. Da ist man natürlich ganz nah bei der Kunst, wenn, also das, wenn es darum geht, eine gute Geschichte zu erfinden. Ja. Also eine poetische Geschichte. Ja, genau, genau, das ist die Sache. Es besteht ein Zweikampf oder ein Dreikampf oder ein Zehnkampf between den verschiedenen Poeten. Wer findet eine lustige, amüsante und interessante Geschichte, die jeder sofort glaubt hat, das muss es gewesen sein. Aber Herr von Förster, die Wissenschaft, auch gerade Ihre eigenen Forschungen, das sind doch nicht nur Erfindungen oder schöne Geschichten. Das beruht auch auf Mathematik, auf Zahlen, auf Beweisbarkeit, auf wissenschaftlich unbezweifelbaren Daten. Ja. Naja, aber es gibt jetzt schon so viele Daten, dass man gar nicht mehr die ganzen Daten in seine Geschichte hineinbringen kann. Und dann werden dann künstliche Daten erfunden. Das, das sind zum Beispiel Partikel, Teilchen. Da werden Teilchen erfunden, die das machen, was wir nicht verstehen. Also meine Meinung sind Teilchen immer Lösere von Problemen, die wir nicht anderweitig lösen können. Also Erfindungen, um gewisse Probleme erklären zu können. Das sind Teilchen. Jetzt muss, ich, jetzt muss ich dumm fragen. Ja, das verstehe ich. Ja. Ja, ich lasse es mir ein bisschen besser erklären. Ja. Sagen wir, es ist eine Lücke in meine Theorie. Ja, da kann ich nicht mehr drüber springen. Darf ich, ach so, nein, das sind einfach neue Teilchen die entweder grün, gelb oder, oder sprechig oder ich weiß nicht was alles machen, die ersetzen das Loch in meiner Theorie. So behaupte ich, dass jedes Teilchen, was wir heute in der Physik lesen, ist die Antwort für eine Frage, die wir nicht beantworten können. Na, aber das ist doch schrecklich. Wie kann man denn auf der Grundlage einer Theorie, die Löcher hat, also auf so einem anscheinend wackeligen Fundament, also Maschinensysteme, weltweit sich ausdehnende Maschinensysteme quasi ins Unendliche wachsen lassen. Ja. Ist das denn nicht riskant oder gefährlich? Ja. In diesem weltweit funktionierenden Maschinensystem sind alle Aussagen richtig. Und das ist natürlich das, was man gerne haben möchte. Und warum sind die richtig? Weil sie sich alles von anderen Aussagen ableiten lassen. Wo führt das hin? Ja. Wie geht das denn weiter? Ja, immer mit, mit weiter ableiten. Ja, aber es gibt doch irgendwo Grenzen. Eben nicht. Das ist das Schöne. Da kann man immer wieder weiter. In der Logik? Yes, genau. Aber in der Realität? Wo, wo ist die Realität? Wo, wo haben Sie die? Immer mit, mit weiter ableiten. Ja, aber es gibt doch irgendwo Grenzen. Eben nicht. Das ist das Schöne. Da kann man immer wieder weiter. In der Logik. Yes, genau. Aber in der Realität? Wo, wo ist die Realität? Wo, wo haben Sie die? Wo, wo ist die Realität? Wo, 
It's impossible to write about Woodstock and LSD without asking yourself, where did all this stuff come from? It only takes about five minutes to find out about the universities that were engaging some of the highest performing students in these LSD experiments. Ken Kesey was a championship wrestler in college. He was training for the Olympics. He was a Ford Fellowship Scholar. After joining a study at the Palo Alto VA, he was dosed with LSD and described what he saw as the kind of things you'd see on the inside of a pyramid wall. He gave up wrestling, picked up 2nd Lieutenant United States Marine Corps Ken Babs, and took a bus around the country with the Merry Pranksters to spread LSD to the youth in local towns across the nation. At that time, the drug was being manufactured in Switzerland and brought into the United States by a guy named Ronald Stark, who was later arrested for terrorist acts in Italy and released from jail by producing what the judge called credible evidence that Stark was a member of the US government secret services. Now, I'm the kind of person, like many of you, I enjoy history, and I like to see things in context. What is the context of Woodstock? Someone said once that Woodstock was the last stop of the Merry Pranksters' acid tests. My true expertise in the scientific field is auditing and root cause investigation. So it's hard for me to not want to pull the cover back to see what's underneath. When you start to follow the LSD, you very quickly find that the root of the scientific studies happening at the time, taking the world toward a psycho-civilized society. One of the things that they said at the Macy conferences was that wars are begun in the minds of men, and so that's where the work must begin, to end war. Heinz von Forster was a participant of the Macy Conferences. This was a conference that sought to bring together notable scientists in varied disciplines in order to produce something beyond science, what von Forrester called systemics. He is the creator of the theory of second order cybernetics, which I can't accurately describe here, but it's basically looking at things as a whole and then including the observer in your calculations. Most of these guys were studying anti-aircraft systems during World War II, and when they tried to make a machine control a gun turret, they realized that a turret needs a certain amount of force to turn, but if the grease on the gun is cold that day or if it's jammed with sand, the force required to push the gun turret would be different. This led them to research what they called feedback systems in which it would, you know, tell the gun how much force it needed to push the gun a little harder because the grease was cold, basically. After they've discovered feedback systems, they immediately turned that inward onto the human mind. This began to a series of classified research into the location of the mind, and what they called control and communication in the animal and the machine. And you know, this is a recurrent theme among people who are involved with LSD. They're also usually involved with rocket targeting systems. If you'll remember Owsley Stanley, he was working at JPL. And in addition to supplying the country with acid after Sandoz ran out, Owsley was also working as a test engineer with Rocketdyne in Los Angeles. In this capacity, he worked on the SM-64 Navajo supersonic cruise missile. You know those Russian cruise missiles everybody's worried about? I mean, we had the hippies on that back in the 60s. By the way, the Balkan Sassini is excellent. Rich Orientals, it's almost the Balkan Sobrani, but more like if Dunhill had made it. I highly recommend it. Back to Von Forrester, he also worked on rocket technology in World War II. He was a Jewish gentleman, but his work on Hitler's rockets made him too valuable for the camps. Some people take issue with von Forrester's work with the Führer, but the leading scientists in the world had 
no problem with it. I'm really unaware of the details myself. Von Forster compares science to a poem or a story that people tell each other. That seems like a decent etymology if you extrapolate that people will challenge the story of each scientist. But what Heinz is touching on here is the impossibility of knowing. And that is something else entirely. He indicates that science, like all other fields, struggle to define reality, especially when they're trying to define the observed reality because they don't take into account the observer. Von Forrester is incredulous when the reporter asked him what the effects the systems he has created will have on the world. These are the machine systems, aka the AI. World? What world? This guy is a leading scientist. He links physics and metaphysics together by the indescribability of life. It's hard to overstate how influential these scientists have been on history. One of von Forrester's influential friends took his theories and applied them to the field of economics to great success. That man's name, you might have heard it before, George Soros. In addition to his studies in mathematics and systems research, von Forrester had a singular passion. His unique invention of a doomsday equation. He was obsessed with controlling the population of the planet fearing that it was out of control. Quoting from his paper on the doomsday calculation, Thus we may conclude with considerable confidence that the principle of adequate technology, which proved to be correct for over a hundred generations, will hold for at least three more. Fortunately, there is no need to strain the theory by undue further extrapolation because, and here the pessimists erred again, our great-grandchildren will not starve to death. They will be squeezed to death with population. In view of this uncomfortable picture, it is clear, while the pessimists, one way or other, are Malthusians by profession, the optimists must be Malthusians at heart, hoping that at some time, somehow, something will happen that will stop this ever faster race to self-destruction. Let's remember that Malthusianism is the belief that the population is growing so high that it'll eventually trigger a population die-off. The event is called a Malthusian catastrophe. All right, going back to von Forrester's research paper. Quote, since the tendencies today do not point in the direction of observable efforts to reduce the mean lifespan of human individuals. On the contrary, we see a steady increase in this value. It is clear that our peopleostat has to control the fertility and it has to maintain it at a level. And he gives basically an equation here of what he's working with. Today, this means cutting the birth rate to about half its present value, or in other words, cutting the size of an average family to just a little above two children. Tomorrow, of course, it will be more difficult since, as we have seen, the gap between birth rate and death rate is widening every minute. Among the suggestions that have been advanced for meeting this problem, legislation, heavy taxation of families that have more than two children, cancellation of tax deductions, and so on. Space travel has been proposed recently as an alternative. It is only unfortunate that no re-entry permit to Earth can be given these space trotters. You know, if some of this stuff sounds a little crazy, I'm just, remember, they always tell me to trust the experts, right? This guy is the expert when he wrote this in 1960. Von Forrester's Doomsday Equation the formula gave 2.7 billion as the 1960 world population and predicted that the population growth would become infinite by Friday, November 13th, 2026. Good old Friday the 13th. 
Von Forrester would have you believe that everything is connected, that you are part of the system in which the reality of our consciousness is defined. Now, I'm no expert in physics at all, but I do feel like Von Forrester was right about everything being connected. You, me, everything. And that feels a little personal right now, you know, because he predicted Doomsday would be in 2026, that's in four years, on November 13th. And that is my birthday.